So I'm going to be really brief tonight. This is not going to be a long message at all because I think you all would much rather continue that worship than of the, our worship of the creator and king of the universe than listen to me talk. So um, we're going to be brief, but it does seem that God really is doing something special right now, you know, uh, just all over the place. I, like David said, I just visited Asbury. I didn't go with Mike Van Meter. Mike Van Meter went with me, just make that clear. No, actually, it's funny. We just happened to be going at the same time, really, and we were there. Um, and w- what I witnessed was amazing there. I saw people coming from all over the world, literally, simply to worship God. You know, I mean, that was it. There was nothing else going on. You know, there wasn't crazy manifestations or people giving out free stuff or celebrity pastors or, you know, a rock band. It was it. Like, I was there for one day for a bunch of hours, and we just worshiped. People would give their testimony. They'd read a scripture. we worship. And that was it. And uh, that was pretty incredible. And when I came back, it was clear that the Holy Spirit was doing something here. I came back, and that Sunday uh, church was just incredible that weekend. And it, it seems that there is an unusual hunger for worship right now, and an unusual, it's been unusually easy to worship. You know, uh, on Sunday, I saw how it was at church, and so we decided to throw a worship gathering. Less than 24 hours notice. It wasn't a Foothills event. It wasn't promoted very widely. It was just threw it up on Facebook, and over 250 people came to worship God for an hour and a half straight. And honestly, I think we could have probably worshiped for another hour with the same level of enthusiasm and hunger. Um, Then I heard Tuesday night, the very next night, you guys here worship for an hour over the time you were supposed to end, and the Spirit of God was just here. And like uh, David said, it seems like this same experience is happening in countless churches all over our country, and maybe even all over the world. So in that spirit, again, I want to make it short, get back to worshiping. So my whole message tonight is based off just two words. Those two words are make room. And what I want to do tonight quickly is just address some questions. You know, how do we approach God when he seems unusually accessible? You know, Bible tells us in Isaiah 55, 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. It tells us to take advantage of those moments when God is available. There's moments where he can be found more easily than other times. There's moments where he is more near than other times. And those words don't adequately describe it but it's the best like we can do with our language. Just He just seems close. He just seems present and accessible. And it seems like we're in one of those times. But those times can be confusing. It can be uncomfortable. It can be unfamiliar. When God's doing something that we haven't seen him do before, maybe you haven't experienced before. And so how do we respond when God draws near? How do we respond and draw near to God. And so those two words come from 2 Corinthians 7 two. Paul says, make room for us in your hearts. We wronged no one. We corrupted no one. We took advantage of no one. See, Paul, in, in this moment, Paul had been forced to defend his ministry. He's talking to the Corinthians, and these are the people that he had shared the gospel with, people that he had gotten saved, people that he had grown in their walk with the Lord. He he established the church there. He ministered to them. But suddenly accusations and criticisms had been raised against him. There were doubts and suspicions spread about the legitimacy of his ministry and of his motives for doing what he did. And he was forced to defend himself. And a couple of years ago, I was praying, and I felt like God spoke those words to me. In a moment of prayer, God just said, make room for me. And I feel like this phrase, that, as I began to study that 
term. I began to study that in, in the scripture, and, uh, and I learned a couple things, and I feel like it really um, is applicable to us right now and important in this moment for how we respond in this time when God seems available. And so there's three meanings that this word, this phrase has, make room. Number one is simply lead, to leave space which may be filled by something else. Make room, right? Makes sense. That can be in our time. It can be in our thoughts. It can be in our, in our attentions. It can be in our affections. The question for simply is just, is there any room in your life for God? I think this is probably the most important and the most applicable aspect of this phrase for us in this moment. Because the truth is, we're probably the most distracted and amused generation, the amused people to ever exist on the face of the earth. Our lives are so full of stuff. They're so full of amusements and entertainment and distractions and every other thing we could possibly imagine. We don't realize it because we're just used to it. This is what we've grown up with. But our minds and our hearts and our attention is just inundated 24-7. And the truth is, is social media is probably the greatest single enemy we have in this area. You know, our screen times on our phone our hours spent on social media would probably, I already see some looks, probably be embarrassing to us if people knew. That's me included. You know, I have an iPhone, and so I get my weekly screen time report, and I can go on there and look at how many hours I spent on each app, including Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I don't have a TikTok, you know, never will. But it's embarrassing. And this is a side note, but Something I think that we really need to take seriously and deal with is this. Social media, I think, is the most toxic things for our minds and our souls that has ever been invented. I don't know. I mean, maybe pornography is more toxic. But I don't know if social media is, is maybe even worse for us. <laughs> Not that they're like, that's better. I just want to really make it clear. I, I think social media has been absolutely awful for us as human beings and for your generation especially. The, the, the statistics, the, the studies they've done on it, on the effect on our minds, on our hearts, depression, anxiety, suicide, all these things, just every horrible thing is, is so tied to social media. I think it's destroying a generation. And uh, sorry, that's a side note, but we're talking about being distracted. Is there any room in your life for God? You know, we want God to move. We want God to speak to us. But our minds are so filled with noise and nonsense that we can't listen or hear him. We've lost the, the ability to be silent. In fact, there's lots of people that hate silence. They don't want a quiet moment in their life. From the moment they wake up, the music's on, the, you know, the radio's on, the TV's on, the screen's on every moment of their day. I, uh, a while back, started going to the gym, and I love going in the sauna after I go and work out. It's a wonderful time. It's really good for you. And, it, and for me, it's a time I can just sit and just be quiet. <laughs> my phone's gone. My headphones are on. But every time I'm in there, 90% of the people in the sauna have their headphones in and their phones out like this. I'm like, first of all, that's horrible for your phone. It's like 190 degrees in there. One time I brought in my phone and I couldn't even touch it. It was so hot. But it's just we're, we're so used to it. They're on there just scroll, 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 scroll. And the music's blaring. I can hear it. In, I can hear it from where I'm sitting. We hate silence. But honestly, silence is a wonderful and important spiritual practice that I really encourage you guys to put into your life. Do you have moments of silence? Times where it's just, I mean, really, your mind, your heart, you're just quiet. Our time is so full that we can't just sit with him or make times for the things he would have us do. And even good things can be the enemy if they crowd out room for him. 
You know, I've been playing a lot of chess recently on chess.com. Any, anybody? Anybody? I'll play, I'll play with you. You can add, add me. You know, and I spend a lot of time playing that. And it fills my mind and my thoughts, you know, like I was worshiping recently. And I, it, as I'm worshiping, I'm, you know, chess moves are going through my mind. I'm like, you know, it's just my mind. It's so full. There's no room for the Lord, right? That's a bad thing. Is there room in your life? Is there room in your thoughts, in your time, in your schedule, in your affections, in your attention for the Lord? You know, if we want to, if we want more of God, we need to carve out space for Him. And this means sacrificing things, not just fitting Him in where you can, but intentionally giving things up for him because you want that time, that space in your life and your mind to be filled with him instead. You know, I've been personally challenged by this so much. Am I making room or am I just fitting him in? I think that's one of the biggest challenges that God wants to present to us and and the one way we can respond to him in this moment of him being near is to make room for him. Create space that can be filled by him. Number two thing this means is to receive or accept. Make room means receive or accept something. And that has to do with our belief system, our mindset. In Matthew 19, 11, Jesus was teaching some hard things, some new things to the people. And he said, not all men can accept this. Not all men can receive this because it went against their understanding of who God is, of how God worked, of their beliefs. And that's been a, a bit of an issue in this movement. Some people have had such a hard time believing that God can move or they have such a rigid idea of what it looks like that they won't accept it when he does. You know, I've, I've seen a lot of stuff, again, on Twitter and, you know, social media, all that, of people that are just have so many criticisms for what's going on. And I was there, and I'm like, I, it was beautiful. People were just worshiping. Worship prayer and the Word of God and giving testimonies. Repentance, confession, like, how much more beautiful could it be? But they won't accept him when he does something different. Can I, can I tell you something? We do not understand God nearly as much as we think we do. And even some of the very smart Christians in this world are the worst at it. You know, we spend so much time studying systematic theology and figuring out all the boxes, you know, for God that we don't realize that God doesn't fit into any of our boxes. He can do whatever he wants, <laughs> The only things that we really know about God are the things that he clearly tells us about himself, right? He'll never violate his nature. He'll never violate his laws. It definitely doesn't mean that we can just make up whatever we want about God. We see a lot of that with, the, with homosexuality, with the transgender movement. But often we think we have God all figured out. And the truth is that he does not care about hurting your feelings by ignoring your opinions on what he should or shouldn't do. And so we have to ask the question, do we have room in our thinking for a God that sometimes doesn't make sense? When he says make room, it also means make room in your understanding of what God does, of what he's like, of how he moves, so you can receive it and accept it when he does move. Sometimes something like this can be unfamiliar, it can be new, it can be uncomfortable. Do you have room for that? For a God that can do wildly and abundantly beyond what you could ever ask or think. The third thing it means, make room, it can mean to go forward to advance or to gain ground. One way of saying this is to pursue or to earnestly desire. See, what's happening right now in this moment is really just a call to seek the Lord. What we're experiencing isn't the final thing. It's a teaser. It's an appetizer 
It's an invitation to seek him more than you ever have before. And these times in worship are great, but the the question is, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do when it's done? Because it'll end, right? It's, the worship is powerful right now, and then it, <laughs> it won't be as powerful as it is right now. And are you just going to enjoy this time, and then it's done, and go back to your life? Or are you going to respond? Are you going to make room for him by pushing forward, by pursuing him, and, and moving forward in a way you haven't before? Are you going to seek him in a greater way? Are you going to pursue him? Will you confess and repent the things that aren't right in your life? Will you obey him in a greater way? This can also mean to gain ground. This is talking about the area that's outside of us, the area that's around us. It's, like, it's almost like a, seems like a, a term of battle to gain ground. It's like you're crowded around and you advance and move forward and gain ground. Are we gaining ground for the Lord in our world? Are we making room for him in the world around us? Do you have a heart for the lost? Do you have a heart for your lost family members, for your co-workers, for your classmates, for your neighbors? See, because this isn't just for you. God's not doing all of this just so you can have a great time in worship. And again, that's nothing wrong with that. I love it. But he loves the lost and he deeply desires their salvation. A great measure of the heart of a Christian is their burden for the lost because that's his burden and that's his heart. And if we really have the heart of Christ, then we're going to have a heart for the lost. That's something that's been a challenge for me, a real challenge for me at times in my life when I'm just cold and unconcerned about people that are dying and going to hell. You know, Brianna just gave me awful news tonight about a youth venture kid who just got shot the other day and he's dead. You know, and it's life and death sometimes. People are hurting. People are uh, right now are suffering like never before with anxiety and depression and struggling with suicidal thoughts. You know, and people's lives are destroyed. Do we have a heart for those people? And also pursuing him, it just means responding and obeying him in whatever he wants you to do. There's what he's doing in you, and then there's what he wants you to do outside of you. There's how he wants you to respond to how you're experiencing him through repentance, through confession, through obedience, through serving him in some way and reaching out to people that need that help. And if that's lacking in you, then I would challenge you, repent and ask him, to reignite it in you. Where's the worship band? I think I was successful in being short. One of the, I think this call is one of the greatest calls that God is calling his church to in this moment when he's moving. Make room for me. Make room for him in your life, in your time, in your attention. Make room for him in your thinking, in your beliefs, and receiving what he does. Make room for him by going forward into a world that's hurting and lost. And so as we go back into worship, I just want to challenge you. What is God calling you to do? Because when he draws near, he also speaks. And I think that if we can listen, if we will listen, he's going to challenge you in some area of your life. He's going to challenge you to make room in some way, to respond to him in some way. Maybe you've been far from him in some way in your life, or some area in your life where you know you need him. You know you need to get something out. You need to bring something in. And so respond to God. Seek the Lord while he may be found and draw Call upon him while he is near. Amen. Well, let me pray. Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you for being near. Lord, we are um, honored and humbled and overwhelmed that you draw near to us. 
You're a God that's beyond what we could ask, what we could think, what we could understand. And we're small and insignificant. And yet you draw near to us, Lord. I pray you'd help us to respond in worship and praise, to respond in gratitude to you, to respond in humility and submission and obedience to you. Help us to draw near to you as you draw near to us. Amen.